right, ladies and gentlemen, please check in your helmets arrivals at the door. The show is about to begin. The Hot Club, starring Ronnie Golden, Richard Branch, Josie Lawrence, me, Arthur Smith, but thank heavens not, Giles Brandreth. <laughs> Evelyn, on your shoulders was a wise head. You were not so old when you wrote Bride's Head. But Evelyn, uh, if uh, you uh, were uh, head, uh, Hang on, Richard, what's this? This is my tribute to Evelyn War. It's not war this week, it's war. War? Good God. Huh, what is that good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> to do with Evelyn War. <laughs> they say being in a war is long periods of tedium punctuated by brief moments of frantic action. A bit like Josie's sex life. <laughs> Except without the moments of frantic action. It's war! It's war! It's war! Oh dear, war! Ain't it wonderful, Scarlet? We're going to war. Oh, Fiddle Dee, right in the middle of my party. <laughs> Will you support us, Scarlet, honey? Well, that depends. On what? On um, whether blue or grey goes best with my eyes. <laughs> but that silly old war won't come near Tara. <laughs> oh. I will rebuild Tara. <laughs> Phew, there, finished. <laughs> I'm leaving you, Scarlet. But Red, what will I do? Where will I go? Frankly, my dear, I don't... Oh, never mind. I'll think of something. Bye. <laughs> On September the 3rd, 1939, the people of Great Britain were glued to their radios. There'd been a mix-up with the varnish at the factory. <laughs> But imagine if Neville Chamberlain had to make that speech on the radio today. Hi there, everyone. This is Kid Chamberlain here on Wonderful Radio One. Radio One. And this morning, our ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that if they didn't begin withdrawing their forces from Poland by noon today, a state of war would exist between us. <laughs> I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is now at war with Germany. Oops. Okay, let's have a look at the traffic news and uh, the German-Polish border is extremely busy at the moment. Oh no, it's Mr. Angry. And that was Adolf Hitler, of whom Kurt Valheim once said, I don't know, I've never heard of him. I can't remember nothing, honest guy. <laughs> Hello. What's a nice fly like you doing on a dump like this? I was just having my lunch. Well, what is it? Chicken cordon bleu, beef bourguignon? Nah, I thought I'd have dog poo again. <laughs> Did you hear that bang last night? Yeah, what was it? A thermonuclear war. There's human beings everywhere. Dying like... Well, dying like us, really. How come we survived, then? We don't seem to be affected at all. Well, apart from being six foot tall, of course. We've mutated, you see. Oh, I wondered why I could talk. We seem to have become half man, half fly. <laughs> Funny, you don't look much like Jeff Goldblum. Who? Oh? You know, I have no idea. I seem to have developed half a human brain. A bit like a sun reader. A what? I haven't a clue. The same's happened to me. Did any human being survive then? Only the ones who started it all. They were all safely hidden away in holes underground. Bunkers. They must have been. In that 
case, there's a chance for us to become the dominant species. After all, we can talk. We're six feet tall. I don't think so. Why not? Here comes Boris the spider. Where? Driving that Sherman tank. Ah! I see Colin's just taken a new job at Aldermaston. Yeah, he must be making a bomb. <laughs> when will it all end, sir? The mud, the wire, the endless digging in? I can't stand it. Not cut out for landscape gardening, then, Simpkins. <laughs> Look out! Mr. Parkins! Can I have a word with you? Something wrong, madam? Mr. Perkins, when I asked the best landscape gardeners in Surrey to redesign my garden, I expect a little upheaval. Naturally. I, I don't expect a sea of mud, miles of barbed wire, shell holes, and my entire rhododendron walk being replaced by a trench called Oxford Street. Well, that's what you asked for. You wrote to us that you wanted a garden that would look like it was the Somme all the year round. The Somme? I said the summer! I'll kill that secretary of mine. <laughs> well, you'd better get your men to put things right, hadn't you? I'm afraid I can't do that, madam. Most of them were lost in the first week. Lost? The cream of Surrey's landscape gardeners. All for a hundred yards of mud. A hundred and ten if you count the patio. Ah, oh, we lost the patio in a surprise German offensive. Well, I want it back. Oh, Jerry's dug in deep. It could take years. Oh, no. My husband is just going to die. He's in the trenches too, Mum. Don't worry, he'll come through. No, I mean it's... Oh, what's the use? It's too late to do anything now. Why don't you just all go home? What? Back to Blighty? Oh, oh everybody! everybody. Honestly, this is a complete disaster. Oh, I'm sorry, madam. I just hope you've made a better job in the front garden. That little arbour I want. <laughs> arbour. Now, the famous hot club technique, if you've got an old joke you want to tell, try putting it to music. I sang in Vietnam, protest songs and slogans. I'm a jaded man, but my guitar isn't broken. So how many singers are looking for a title? And how many singers to put an end to war so how many singers does it take to change a light bulb the answer my friend is four <laughs> one to sing the song and that's me and three, three to, to sing, sing the backing, backing harmony Mr. Khrushchev, this is President Kennedy. If you don't call those missiles back from Cuba, you'll be pushing the world to the brink of nuclear war. <laughs> Hello, Kremlin. What department do you require? Get me Mr. Khrushchev, quickly. Putting you through. Kremlin, tax and libraries department. <laughs> what? Will you hold, please? <laughs> Hello? Hello? God damn it! Thank you for holding. Parks and libraries. How can I help you, Conrad? You can help me by getting Nikita Khrushchev and telling him to withdraw his missiles before he starts World War III. Um, sorry. Are these missiles in one of our parks and libraries? No, they're on a boat to Cuba. Oh, I think you've got the wrong department, comrade. You will have a nice day. <laughs> right, that's it. It's war. You got four minutes to live, Rusky. General, this is the president. 
fire all phase one nuclear missiles on Moscow. Hello, Pentagon. What department do you require? And that, believe it or not, was how World War III was averted. <laughs> of course, for writers and artists, a decent war can revive a flagging career. In the same way, an alleged 2,000 quid in a brown envelope did wonders for Geoffrey Archer. <laughs> the hot club goes back to World War I and visits the first battalion of war poets. OK, settle down. Sassoon? Sir. Graves? Sir. Owen? Sir. Blyton? Sir. <laughs> Blyton, do you really think you're cut out to be a war poet? What do you mean, sir? Well, take last week's homework. You were asked to outline the atrocity of trench combat using either poetry or the classical novel. That's right, sir. Then why, in God's name, did you hand in Noddy and Big Ears Go Sailing? You didn't like it. Blyton, I think you're missing the point. War is nasty. People die. They do not prance around the countryside in bright red cars waving to Bumpy Dog and Mr Plod the policeman. They don't? No, Blyton, they don't. This war is also not being fought by groups of children called the Famous Five, who seem to do nothing more than have scrummy teeth with lashings of cake. <laughs> in fact, nothing that you have written, Blyton, accurately reflects life in the army. That's not true, sir. Noddy and Big Ears are, um, you know. No, Blyton, I don't know. <laughs> what are they? Noddy and Big Ears are, um, chums. Chums? Oh, chums. Yes, sir, chums. Oh, well, that's different, Blyton. Good work. A minus. Thank you, sir. <laughs> It's often been said that war is hell. This is, in fact, a shortened version of the original. War is, hello, would you mind terribly much if we invaded your country and killed you? Because in the old days, battles were very polite affairs, conducted according to good manners and the etiquette of war, as seen at the Battle of Waterloo. Stop! Stop the battle! See that Frenchman there? Third row from the back? We can't fight him! Why not, my Lord Wellington? We haven't been introduced. Is he on the guest list? Er, uh, no. I think he's a gate crasher. Then get security to throw him out. Carry on. Right, time to fire the cannons. Off you go. Politely now. Prepare to fire. Excuse me. Fire. Sorry. <laughs> well done. The battle is won. Colonel, tell the men to fix bayonets. They're going to slaughter the wounded, my lord? Of course not. They've got to pick up all the litter, put it in big black plastic sacks. After all, it's only good manners to leave this place as we found it. <laughs> Watch out! Like a million girls before me, I heard the closing of the door. My fella joined the forces and went off to fight the war. Months and years alone now stretch out in front of me. The way it makes me feel is as happy as can be. Cause I can get drunk, go for me. Now my husband's in the army Get up late and throw parties Get chatted up by an artist Yes, I can get drunk and go for me And it's great ha. Soon I got a postcard From very far away My other half is lonely He misses me each day on me. I sat up half the night, remembered how he treated me. It served him bloody right, cause I can go mad, get plastered. Has my poor man's been drafted? I can be me, be happy, feel good, or if I want to, feel crappy. Yes, I can go mad and get plastered, and it's great. 
But then another letter brought me tragic news. And this one really shook me. And now I've got the blues. I'm sitting here in sadness. I'll have to learn to grieve. Cause what the letter told me is he's coming back on leave. Now I can't get drunk or go barmy. Now my hubby's back from the army. It's all gone, it's over. When he steps ashore at Dover, no, I can't get drunk or get balmy. And I'm pregnant. <laughs> In the days of knights and armour, members of the royal family would always be at the head of any army going into battle, as opposed to today, when you just wish they were. <laughs> but being king in those days meant a new outfit for every battle. Anything would do, just so long as it clashed with the enemy. Greetings, knave. I would purchase a suit of armour. You want armour? Armour we got. Chain mail like you've never seen. I've oh, just got some lovely two pieces in from Sweden. Finest craftsmanship. I am king. I would have my own armour. Nothing too flashy, only for a battle with France. Then, if Sire could just slip off his jacket whilst I take a few measurements. <coughs> mm. Chest 48. Got a very nice pinstripe. Finest nickel plate. How about that one in yon window? Ah, the double-breasted two-tone. Very wise choice, Sire. Fully rust-proof, won't shrink in the wash, guaranteed dragon-resistant. Slip it on, Sire, shall we? Ah, there, how be that? Like the proverbial gauntlet, Sire. And do I have the leggings to go with that? <laughs> <laughs> that suit of armour is you, Sire. But flares? <laughs> It is the 1370s, sire. They're all the rage. I'll take them, but only on one condition. Don't worry, sire. You'll be invincible in combat. No, 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 no. Not that. Does it make me look like Kenneth Branagh? <laughs> I tell you, if anyone can come up with a way to win this war, then Barnes Wallace is our man. Absolutely. <coughs> Eureka! You've solved it, Wallace. Have I? It's brilliant. I was at the theatre tonight. The lights went down and then two spotlights were shone from different angles, meeting at a predetermined point. What if we fix spotlights to our bombers, we can judge the exact height at which to drop the bouncing bomb and so defeat the Germans? No. What then? I want to drop Danny LaRue on Dresden. <laughs> Don't you see? It's perfect. The last thing Jerry expects is to be bombed by a female impersonator. I quite like the bouncing bomb idea. No, no, it's boring. It's just the same old boffin type idea. But it wins wars. And so will Danny. God, I can see it now, the soft drone of a Lancaster. Guy Gibson up front flying low to avoid anti-aircraft flight. And Danny nervously singing, I'm just a girl who can't say no, in a plunging <laughs> sequin number. And so it was that this brilliant plan, the Danny Busters, was put into operation one dark November night. Nervous, Danny? Oh, me lovey? No, I've been in showbiz now for 25 years. How do I look? Lipstick's a bit smudged. Oh, damn. What about the dress? Not too obvious, hmm? No, just enough to do a lot of damage. Oh, you are a sweetie. Approaching target. Good luck, Danny. And cue music. and bomb hatch. Here goes, lovers. Break a leg, Danny. I'm just a girl who can't say no. Ah! Later, back in London. OK, take him away. You can't take me away. I'm a genius. I know. What about Dame Edith Evans dropped on Hamburg? <laughs> or, or we could perform Hamlet in code. So dropping Danny LaRue on Dresden didn't work, then? Nope, not one casualty. Damn. Instead, they gave him four standing ovations. 
Any other ideas? Not really, no. Although... Yes? Well, Wallace may have been onto something really big that could end civilization as we know it. Look at this formula. Good God, what is it? Nuclear weapons? No. A prototype Bonnie Langford. <laughs> Come on, love. Push them out. That's it. Power, power. That's it. Love the camera. Love it. That's it. Love. A bit of leg. Yeah, love it. Good, good, good. Lovely. Look, my dear chap, we just want an ordinary photographic record of the battalion. <laughs> 1916. The shelling. The terrible shelling. Was there no end to this mountain of peas? <laughs> Was there no end to these terrible jokes? <laughs> there was, because 18 years old vegetable technician, John Tompkins, had volunteered for the Royal Navy. His first attempt to join up had been a disaster. Realising he had had to lie about his age, he had gone over the top and claimed to be 64. <laughs> However, like a fat bottom, that was behind him now. And he saluted his captain, who was standing on the quay. The captain looked magnificent in his smart new uniform, complete with gold braid and, oddly, a green and red headband. Hi there, boy. You doing all right? I'm Captain Groovy, but you can call me Roy, understand? <laughs> John reflected that the captain was an unlikely figure for a First World War naval officer. But then John was an unconventional kind of sailor himself. Tompkins reporting for duty? Because John Tompkins was not her real name. She was a brummy lass who didn't want her sex to prevent her from fighting. Her real name was John Simpson. <laughs> That's a pretty high voice you got there, Tompkins. Yes, sir. I, I'm a eunuch, sir. Really? I'm a Capricorn. <laughs> hey, you seem like a cool kind of dude, Tompkins. Yes, I'm quite cool, sir, but I've packed a jumper. <laughs> Real good, and no sense of humor as well. <laughs> Just the sort of guy we're looking for to hang around at the bottom of the sea. Sir, from my studies at naval school, I was led to believe boats were supposed to stay on the surface of the water. <laughs> Not submarines, boy. But, sir, surely submarines don't come into operation until the Second World War. Are you psychic? No, once I've been at sea a few days, I'll be fine. <laughs> Captain Groovy took John on board and gave him a rudimentary lesson. See this? It's a rudimentary. <laughs> the captain explained that when he wanted the submarine to dive, he would give the following order. OK, guys, you ready out there? Yeah! All right, well, let's get down. Let me tell you about a dance you all can do. Put on a rubber suit and your flippers, too. Cover yourself in baby lotion. We're heading for the Atlantic Ocean. OK, guys, get ready to take me to the bridge. Get your periscope up. Look real mean. Survey the scene like a submarine. Get down. <laughs> Don't drown. <laughs> you want torpedoes? Hey, we got them. We're going to get down right to the bottom of the sea, that is. <laughs> Gotta watch what we do, this is Radio 2, get down. We got torpedoes, we got depth charges, we even damn sight funkier than a little and large is. <laughs> well, that's not slander, but still, who cares? Get down! <laughs> We're men together outrageously, doing a square dance, one, two, three, don't get me wrong, we ain't Jesses, we don't use makeup, we don't wear dresses. <laughs> okay, take me to the bridge one more time, guys. So get on up! Get on up. Now get on down. Survey the scene like a submarine. Get up. Get down. Get up. Get down. Two weeks later, John and the crew were gliding slowly through the deep blue sea. The Deep Blue Sea was a guest house in Lowestoft. <laughs> they were billeted there awaiting orders. 
and they were on their way to bed after a hard evening drinking rum, singing old sea shanties and listening to the captain's collection of early soul records. <laughs> Avast there, young Tompkins. It was able seaman Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> An old sea dog, if ever there was one. <laughs> Do you fancy going to the beach and blowing on my conch? Blowing my conch. I thought you meant something else. Oh, 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 I see. You thought I meant producing musical notes from a shell. No, 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 no. <laughs> the old sailor had seen through her lie. John politely rebuffed his advance with a swift boot in the ghoulies. <laughs> but she was worried. Her secret was out. And did she really want a watery grave? As she strolled along the beach, a school of fishes poked their head out of the water and sang to her. We're little fish in the watery blue. We've got a piece of advice for you. The sweetest little fish you've ever seen. Don't go in that submarine. <laughs> Don't go on boats. Not even barges. Beware submarines. Beware, Beware depth charges. <laughs> swimming, swimming, swim, swim all day. The fish's song was to prove ominous, and six months later, John Tompkins was no more. The depth charges had done for her. At £14 an hour, she just couldn't afford to pay them. <laughs> she changed her name and left the Navy. Hot Club, written and performed by Arthur Smith, Josie Lawrence, Ronnie Golden and Richard Branch. Sketches written by Mark Burton, John O'Farrell, Bill Matthews, Alan Whiting, Michael Dines, Darren Slade, Ian Keeler and Mark Brissenden. The producer was Lissa Evans. Yeah.